The Poetry Center bringing poetry to Patterson since 1980 at Passaic County Community College. Hello everyone, my name is Jim Gwynn. Um, it's, it's a big pleasure to be um, introducing our next poet, but um, first off, I want to make a, uh, a shameless plug for Lips Magazine. I've worked with um, Laura for many years and um, started with her on Lips in 19, no, back in the 19s, yeah, 1996, well, 7, or something like that. And um, with the continuation of uh, Lips through the board, uh, we're able to bring you a lot of different poets from a lot of different backgrounds. And uh, without the board, I don't know if uh, the print version of uh, Lips Magazine would be continuing. Um, but we are robust, we are strong. Our next uh, reading will be June 15th at the Clifton, New Jersey Main Library. So come on out for that event. It's a Saturday, uh, 2 p.m. And uh, we'll have a good time. I, I see some of you are in the uh, are in the edition, so come on out. We're going to have a whole bunch of other people there too. So um, that uh, that should be should be nice. Um, it's my honor, as I said, to introduce Steve. Excuse me, Stephen S. Mills. Uh, he's published several books through Sibling Rivalry Press, and uh, his work has also appeared in a number of. Uh, uh, magazines and uh, journals, uh, American Poetry Review, Columbia Poetry Review, Antioch Review, New York Quarterly, and others. Uh, two of his books were placed on um, the Over the Rainbow list, which is compiled every year by the American Library Association, uh, which does very important work. Um, he's also a, a playwright, author of a couple plays, Waiting for Manilow, and Is That All There Is? Lives in New York City and um, has made it out here today to New Jersey. Please welcome Stephen S. Mills. Thank you. Uh, no, this is a great event. I really appreciate uh, being invited to read as, as a finalist here, and I really appreciated uh, Barry's introduction uh, about about Laura Boss and learning more about that, which makes more sense of why my book was was selected <laughs> here. So, uh, this, I'm reading pieces from that manuscript. Uh, the book is called uh, "We Will Always Be Perverts," and it explores um, aspects of of queer life. All of the poems begin uh, with the same two words. So they all begin with "in life." Uh, all the titles begin with that. Um, so the, f the first poem I'm going to read is called In Life, They Are Calling Us Groomers Again. Remember that night in college when we shaved each other's legs, or leg in my case, so much hair, your arm growing tired, my body unable to stand still any longer, so we gave up and fucked because that's what you do when you are young and in love, and some of the only queers on your small Midwestern campus where other boys write fag on your dorm room door. So I went around with one hairy leg, one smooth, or as smooth as your razor skills allowed. Though it didn't matter, it was winter in Indiana, pants and socks and snow. I never shaved again. I like legs hairy, ass too. Like the time I got second place in a hairiest ass contest at a leather bar our first year in New York. Second in a room full of bears is an accomplishment. <laughs> but the real prize was the blurry photo you took drunk from across the bar. Though my hair isn't dark, which makes it hard to see in photographs, but still I know it's there, captured. And I'm reminded of those young men's faces I saw at the Museum of Modern Art, snapshots under glass by an unknown photographer who took portraits at fairs and carnivals throughout the Midwest in the 1950s and how I zeroed in on those young men, a rarity, arms around each other, chiseled handsome faces, and immediate recognition across time and space. How one of them might have brushed a hair from the other's face right before the camera snapped shut, a simple act, 
like when you pluck the stray hairs from my shoulders without my request, and I let out exaggerated shouts of pain and playfully tell you to stop, and you say, grooming is an act of love. All right, um, in, in life, we dance at a gay bar named after a dead first lady. And they play Jolene by Dolly, and we sing at the top of our lungs as the boys all move in and out of doors, to and from the dance floor, to and from the water that is so close by here on the edge of the island. And you say, can you imagine writing a song about a bank teller you were jealous of and having it survive this long? And I laugh, asking if you've forgotten I'm a writer, and no matter what any writer tells you, that is always our goal, survival. And popping up in odd places, like a bar named after Jackie O in Greece, where her face is blown up on the side of the stairwell, young and fresh Jackie, a little blurry, all before fame and tragedy, which makes me think of other dead first ladies, and how people rewrite the stories of dead white women, always giving them extra room, like when Hillary Clinton praised Nancy Reagan for her work fighting AIDS and all the gays gasped. How easily the pieces are rearranged. Don't speak ill of the dead, they say. Fuck that, I say. But Jackie was different, brave and beautiful, with a keen eye for fashion, which makes her an easy gay icon. Like her insistence on continuing to wear that bloody pink Chanel suit that changed America, changed our access to information. But that picture isn't here in this bar where we dance miles from home, trying to forget the tragedies of America, of our moment, of our soon-to-be history. And I think of the mother I recently saw in Washington, D.C., taking her little boy around the First Lady's exhibit, which is mostly dishes and dresses, and how she stopped in front of Mamie Eisenhower's dress, turned to her son and said, the dress is prettier than the woman. She wasn't very attractive, was she? And I remember how he looked up at Mamie's photograph and asked, but was she nice? And I wanted to hug this boy right in front of the dishes and the dresses and his awful mother, but all I did was stand there and listen as she answered, I don't know, I didn't know her. And this poem is, uh, is called, In Life, the woman sitting next to me on the plane asks, what happens if a big wave hits New York City? <laughs> she has spent the trip reading her Bible, open-faced on the tray table, which has now been stored in its upright position for our descent into New York City, which we can see from above in all its glistening winter glory. She doesn't begin with the wave, but other simpler questions, which I try to answer quickly going back to my own book, which is a Bible of sorts, a Bible of some queer man's boyfriends, his hookups, his affairs. I wonder if she's seen all the fucks and holes on the pages as I flipped them. I'm guessing no, since she's now engaging me in mindless conversation. Is Central Park really that great? Yes, I say it is. She's just passing through, heading farther south, worries she'll miss her connection and get stuck in this city where she's never been, just over it, through it, never fully in it. I say she should come sometime, though I don't mean it. Then I attempt my, to open my book again, but that's when she spots the Statue of Liberty, as if she's surprised to find it there in the water. It's so small, she says, and I wonder if she understands perspective, our relationship to land. But I just nod, and that's when the wave comes into mind, and the question, so strange, what happens if a big wave hits New York City? She almost whispers it against the window, her lips away from me, so I pretend not to hear, as we get closer and closer to the earth, the landing gear opening, and then that moment of contact, that return. All right, and the, the last piece I'm gonna, gonna read here is uh, it's called In Life My Husband Buys Me a Tourniquet. <laughs> Shows me how to pull the strap, how to twist the metal bar, which he says I'll need to do harder and tighter than I think it needs to go. It's going to hurt. If I'm doing it on myself, I might want to lean against a wall to give myself some leverage, something to push against. Here, try it and I do, 
And then he tightens it a little more to demonstrate his point. My skin purples, always sensitive. You want it as high up the limb as possible, he says, and then you must twist until the bleeding stops. Quickly, you've only got seconds. This is his normal. His is a life of saving lives, of blood and missing limbs, and by default, it is mine. We've moved past denial into this place of talking about the unthinkable, of being prepared like a Boy Scout, of calmly practicing technique, practicing how to save our lives, or maybe how to save the other from the dread of what not saving might mean. Though saving in this case could still mean a missing piece. There's a woman who created an Instagram account for her amputated foot. The foot gets around, beaches, sporting events, airplanes, a skeletal reminder of what was once attached. Humans find so many ways to adapt, like us here in the living room with this tourniquet, our answer to a changing world, something to do when the next tragedy strikes, something to hold in our hands, something to place in our bags, which we will carry through and around this city on our way back to each other. Thank you.